I need to profoundly appreciate the kind guest of our general overseer. God bless you. You're a good man. Your spirit is fine. And I say that with all sense of responsibility. Uh, this, our present Jew, carries a very excellent spirit. Good spirit. First Square Church used to be my second church before the team overthrew you. Just because some people decided to send some of us on sabbatical leave out of this altar. I stood there last 1994 where they were just trying to expand the ancient building that was here. And I'm amazed at the transformation that are taking place over the years. So, we are back from Sabbatica because <coughs> because a good man is in this saddle and the Lord will support you. Jehovah will back you up. Together with our mommy, God bless you. Man. I'm meeting you possibly for the first time. The seen the geo, I've seen you already. Because if a man is so stern as the wife, if a man is friendly as the wife, if a man is a cantacaros fighter, fighting everybody as the wife. I know what I'm talking about. So, I have seen a peaceful woman who decided to make our Jew a peaceful man. God bless you, man. Grace multiply upon your life in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you very much, the rest of the pastor. The Lord will back you up. Grace will be supplied for your race. Together with your mommy, our mommy there. God bless you. Man. <clears throat> when we are in 1994, three months, Friday, Saturday, or see Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the geo, that the Pharaoh be shut down this church that weekend for three months and I stood on this altar 12 straight weekends ministering to thousands of first Quarians, especially ministers all ministers within the Lagos axis were asked to vacate their parishes whatever they were doing those weekends to be present and registered it was a massive prayer school hosted by the first school I think Pastor Rebayo was the resident pastor at that time this is a combination of the finest men God has ever created and they opened up the first school for before that myself and my late elder brother in the campus, Reverend Wilson Badijo, he was at several places. Each place, he bathed. He brought me there compostingly. Because he came from the same background in IVCU. He was a few years ahead of us. So, literally introduced me to the Four Square Church. And then the headquarters took over. I think. Baba Ogunaike, Ogunaike was still around even though he retired but he came for most of the meetings and he was awed by what he saw. So I'm not too distant from the first square church until I went on a compulsory leaf. But then the other first squares in, at the fringes 
He used to bring us Abuja, different places, and um, we have kept in touch. But I'm happy, like I said, I think I came back in July together with many of our colleagues who were sent out of the first squad to me. I don't know for what reason, but thank God we are back and we are back for good. <clears throat> So this weekend, the Lord will do dramatic things in our midst. Great things will happen. Your life shall be revived. Your altars shall come alive again. Ashes of prayer failure will be empty from your altar. And you shall receive fresh coals of fire. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Can I have more volume at the feedback here? At the back. So tonight, I'll be speaking on this subject. The altar, the fire, and the blessings. The altar, the fire, and the blessings that follow. Follow the sequence, the altar. The fire and the attendant blessings. Lord, we ask you to visit us in mercy. Send down the fire upon our altars. Quicken our souls again. In the name of Jesus. Awaken those who are slumbering. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thou, thou sleepest, awake and arise, and Christ shall give you light in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. name of Jesus and legislate upon this altar the activities of fire extinguishers are over on your altar in the name of Jesus I pray for you tonight that God will kindle a new fire in your soul in your spirit in your home in your church in your family and the place of your work in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Blessed be God forevermore. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Please take your seat. The altar, the fire, and the blessing. You will see in some of my writings 
that no religion can do without altar. The altar is a ladder, all right, from the earth, opening up access to the realm of the spirit. The realm of the spirit is literally inaccessible to humans on earth, except via altars. That's why all religions make use of altars. Name them. Is so the altar makes the realm of the spirit accessible. Why? Because humans. No matter how technologically sagacious or developed they are, there are certain problems that can only be solved, all right, by divine powers. I won't say God alone. By divine powers. Problems of healing. Problems too complex. For man to handle. So man seeks. Alright. For solution. From extraterrestrial forces. And to link up. To download. The help. From the celestial world. You need a ladder. Alright. To link you from the earth realm. To the spiritual realm. To the celestial realm. So that ladder. The man uses is called the altar. As soon as the altar is constituted and all the rituals are performed, spirits swoon around the altar. The sacrifices invite the spirits. And so man can collect any help or receive any help he wants to receive once the spirits are around. You will find in the book of Genesis chapter 8 when the ark landed on Mount Ararat. The Bible says no one will not understand of all this and designated certain animals. So as soon as he landed, he took those animals, raised an altar, offered them upon the altar. And the Bible says the Lord smelled a sweet savour and something happened in the heart of God. It had told God, I'll be angry with man. It had told God in anger, all right, had destroyed all living things by flood waters. He was still enraged, regretting that he ever made man. But when the altar ministered to him, the aroma thereof, the heart of God melted. The angry heart of God melted. And without no saying a word. And the Lord said in his heart, No more. I will no more use the flood waters to destroy all earth. Why the earth remain here? Sea time, harvest, summer, winter will not cease. The altar facilitated that. The altar brought forth blessings instead of curses. What am I saying? Spirits, whether God, whether gods, whether deities or spirits respond to the altar, particularly if it carries choice sacrifices. So God blessed mankind and made a covenant that no more will flood waters destroy the earth. Call see of the altar that no are raised unto God. If us Chronicles chapter 21, David, all right, without following the necessary protocols and rituals, decided to conduct a national census and provoke divine wrath. And instantly, the Lord began to destroy people. 70,000 people had died in Jerusalem and the environs. And an angel of destruction was poised, all right. To destroy all Jerusalem. And David began to cry to God. 
Oh Lord, I'm the one that sinned. Lord, judge me and my father's house. Why all these sheep? You kill 70,000 of them and the cooperage. Oh Lord, hold me responsible. And so the Lord sent unto him, Prophet Nathan, and said, You have three choices to run before your enemies, the angel of God destroyed from coast to coast in Israel, and then the third option arrives for you to run before your enemies. And if he looked up, he said, No, don't let me fall to the hands of man. Let me fall to the hand of the Almighty, for his mercies are great. So as he punished, and the Lord told Nathan, tell him to raise an altar. Somebody say altar. Raise an altar. So he went to the treasure floor of Arana, a local government chieftain. All right? All right, a chief of the local domain. The remnants of the Amorites they conquer was Arana. So and the man saw David. And David said, I want to offer sacrifice. And the man said, you have everything. The piece of land, the instruments I use for my oxen, and the oxen, cut them to pieces. Raise your altar. And the man said, it's not that altars are not raised that way. I shall not offer to the Almighty any sacrifice that costs me nothing. I'm going to pay for everything I use to raise the altar. So the man named the price and the man raised an altar. As soon as the aroma reached unto God again, all right, God relented. I told the angel that stretch forth his sword spiritually to slaughter me. He said, put your sword back into the shelf. All right? And the slaughter was averted. Disaster was averted through the altar. Are you listening to me? So, in the New Testament, the altars are spoken. The word altar, in the original Latin means altar. See, altar. A-L-T-A-T-R-E. Altar. Okay, if that's the correct pronunciation. It simply means an elevated platform where sacrifices, gifts, and offerings are offered to gods, to deities, and to spirits to collect help. An elevated platform. All right? We have sacrifices, gifts, offerings are offered to deities, offered to gods, offered to spirits in order to receive help from them. All truths are parallel. As it was in the Old Testament, so it is in the New Testament. The altar. Now in the New Testament, the altar is no longer physical, but spiritual altar. I need to inform you according to Hebrews chapter 13, I think verse 10, 11, the cross is also an altar. He said we have an altar that those who walk in the tabernacle cannot eat their roof. So the cross, which we call Calvary altar, has been the greatest altar of all. And the greatest sacrifice, all right, was offered on that altar. That altar is of perpetual efficacy. The altar of Calvary. So every day we pray, we are drawing from that altar. Are you listening to me? Every time, this altar now, all right, is in alignment with that Calvary altar. That's why this altar carries power. This altar is operating dependently, not independently. Why? It's in alignment with Calvary altar. And that's what God wants your own personal altar to be. To be in alignment with the Lamb's altar. So it can carry power and deliver the goods. If there's anything the devil finds in the life of a believer, it's your altar. If we wage ferocious war on that, for you not to have time, all right, to offer your gifts and sacrifices on the altar, so that situations around you be not changed. One major function of an altar is to alter situations. The altar alters matters. Are you listening to me? If your altar is the real altar, it will handle situations, circumstances that are vexing, perpetual, there, perpetually is been there. But when an altar runs into action, that situation has to be altered. I pray for you on this altar. 
every negative situation of your life before we conclude on Sunday shall be ordered. Lift up your right and say, My altar, say the altar, say the altar, shall alter my situation for good. Say the altar, shall alter my situation for good. Say it again. Amen. So for the Christian, what's an altar? The altar is a particular place at a particular time where and when a child of God meets on a daily or regular basis with his Lord and maker. A particular place, designated place, at a particular time where and when a child of God meets regularly with his creator, redeemer, and maker. Remember, regular. An altar is not an altar on the regular sacrifices and offerings are presented on that altar. Are you listening to me? So that's why the altar of prayer is different from ordinary prayer. If I want to pray, I can pray anytime. I can pray anywhere. All right? Pray anywhere, pray anytime does not constitute an altar. And has its limitations. I can pray anywhere. But you see, Christ himself is an altar personified. But yet, he had locations where he prayed. Mark 1.35 The Bible says, A great while before dawn, he arose from the house, or any house where he stayed, and departed to a solitary place where he did what? He prayed. That was an altar. Mount Olives was an altar that Jesus visited regularly, regularly. The Garden of Gethsemane was an altar. Depending on the location, he had places where he resorted to, to pray regularly at designated time. That constituted altars of Christ while he was on earth. Are you with me, somebody? So, when you say an altar, I mean, look at the shrines. Another word for altar is a shrine. The shrines of our fathers. Since ancient days, they be visiting those shrines with sacrifices, with oblations. At designated time, five o'clock in the morning, or middle of the night, they will be there. Come rain, come sunshine, because the spirit gets angry when you don't fulfill your obligation at the altar. They get angry with the community, killing and smiting people with pestilence because the altar is forsaken. Are you listening to me? So when you raise an altar, you have an obligation to visit the altar regularly and offer the prescribed sacrifices and tokens on the altar if you want the altar to help you. The reason why many Christians are not advancing, the reason why they are not making progress, where they are subjects, all right, to diverse attacks. Life treats them as if they don't know Christ. Life treats them as if they are Muslims, as if they are club ones, as if they are smokers, as if they are drunkards. No difference between the light and darkness. It bothers me a lot. The reason is because the altar is not working for every man has a stable altar. Forget whether it's a Christian or not. Those people, all right, in the other religion, not Islam. The traditional man. If the man has a powerful altar somewhere, he goes around and sees the owner of the entire world. All right, so boisterous, confident, can attack any man, say anything. Why? Wow. He has the altar back in him. Back in him. And when he has made all the noise, he goes back to appease the gods and give them sacrifice to handle his battles for him. I pray in the name of the Lamb, your altars will handle your battle for you. Many Christians are faithful at the altar. Number one, they don't even have any stable altar, any variety altar. They pray anyhow, anywhere, some skip days and times of prayer. I just laugh at them. When you pray, you're not doing God a favor. Are you with me? Prayer is a gift of God to man. An altar to altar matters. 
An altar to alter matters is a gift of God. So nobody is doing God a favor by praying. You only do yourself a favor. So when a Christian raises an altar, which is spiritual, a particular location where he prays regularly. All right? In his bedroom, sitting room, garden behind the house, garden around the house, his office. Location specific. Good altars are location specific. One, good altars are time specific. Two, good altars, okay, are priesthood specific. Three, good authors are assignment specific. And you listen to me. Every good author is location specific. Where you pray, go ask the traditional religionists. Every author is time specific. 12 midnight, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., you meet with your God, your deity, or the spirit you are serving. If you are an unbeliever. Then every altar is priesthood specific. The man that must minister at the altar. For example, family altar is not ordained that the woman, the wife, should lead the altar. If the man all right, refuses to be the priest of his house, then the woman takes over, which is an aberration. The woman can lead choruses. All right, can raise prayer points, can make children pray. But when it comes to leading family altar, is the man given to the man, is the priest of the family, priesthood specific. But when the man is irresponsible spiritually, the woman takes over. Anyway, let's go to scriptures. Amos chapter number nine. Amos chapter nine. Are we together? Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Verses 11 and 12. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is falling, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up its ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Now this God lamenting, I'm coming, lamenting after the tabernacle of David. Amongst other houses of God that were raised and have gone into extinction, God singled out the tabernacle of David. He said, I will raise it up again as it was in the days of old. So it can minister to me as it ministered in the days of David. So you ask the question, what's particular or peculiar about the tabernacle of David? Alright? Now God did not use the word altar here. But the altars were inside the tabernacle. So God was indirectly referring to the altars that David raised in the tabernacle. You remember? After they settled down in their land, the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness planted in the conquered land of Canaan. Alright? gradually transformed into the tabernacle of david everybody visited the tabernacle of moses all right for thousands of years a hundred of years until david came and because the man was both a king a general of the army a prophet so many things in one a worshiper an intercessor he decided to refurbish that tabernacle rebuild it and brought in the ark of covenant into that tabernacle so it was aptly named the tabernacle of david and inside that tabernacle oh david bless his soul he loved god to a fault he brought in the ark of the covenant representing the presence of god okay he had respect for the ark so according to the grace of god upon him in worship in praise in intercession, he recruited the sons of three families. The families of Jethun, the family of Esaph, and the family of Hima. Hundreds of their sons and transfer the grace of worship and praise on his life unto them. Train them to be skillful musicians, skillful musical people. Okay? And planted them in the tabernacle. 
day and night he shifts the minister to the ark. Trumpeters were blowing trumpets. Sacrifices were being offered. Burnt offering were being offered. All right, to the ark, to the God who inhabited the ark. 24-7. That went on. Okay? Incense was burnt before the ark. Sacrifices were offered before the ark. In addition, all right, to what Moses prescribed, David went the extra mile, being an active intercessor who carried the Holy Spirit. Folks in the Old Testament did not have the Holy Spirit, so they relied on burnt offering and incense to make their petition and gift unto God. But David had the Holy Spirit. He's like a New Testament man who lived in the Old Testament era. So, David also recruited these folks to pray articulately, to worship articulately, vocally. All right? And you know, burnt offering on the altar, burnt offering represents worship. Okay? Praises of history. If they wanted to praise the Lord, they merely offered bullock, hyva, and all those animals, and God accepted it as their praises. They never did it articulately until the time of David. He transferred his anointing of articulate worship, articulate intercession to these people. So, apart from the altar of burnt offering, ministry, praise, and worship to Jehovah. Apart from the altar of incense, ministry unto God, intercession. David also seconded this man to praise God verbally, vocally, verbally, articulately. To pray unto God verbally, vocally, articulately. So at any time, T, praise arrived at the throne of God in duplicates. Are you with me, somebody? At any time, T, incense of intercession arrived at the throne of God in duplicate. One, on the physical altars, and secondly, from the physical altar of the hands. And so God suffered so much of that in the time of David. Caught of the grace of God upon his life. God suffered all that as David lived. And the response of God, as God, he hear suicidally suffer from both altars, the altar of men's hearts and the physical altars. Okay, the response of heaven was to send power down, power for conquest, power for victory at the battlefront. Are you informed? Do you know in the lifetime of David, he fought 66 major international battles and won every one of them? This David survived 21 assassination attempts on his life and he was not killed. Are you with me? Mysteriously protected, mysteriously preserved, courtesy of the altar. So, as the altar ministered to God, the response of God was to send power for conquest. Whether it was David at the battlefront, or General Joab, or General Abner, anybody at the battlefront from the tabernacle, power to conquer went forth. They fought like possessed spirits. Are you with me? Against more formidable forces. The Philistines, the Moabites, the Amorites, they were meat for the Israelites. Israelites may be 10,000 confronting half a million troops. It did not matter. The enemy's numerical strength and weapons. Are you listening to me? Because angels fought alongside with them. As long as the altar functioned, power to conquer went to the battlefront. To possess nations, to evict the occupants of the land, dispossess them of the land, and enter into their possession. As long as those two altars went to God and minister, Paris pursue, oh, power came down. Are you with me? Altars don't function for nothing. God responds to altar. Now look at verse number 12. <coughs> we read it again. <coughs> verse 11. In that day will I rest up the tabernacle of David that is falling and close off the breaches, close off the breaches thereof, and I will rest up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Why the tabernacle? What was the work of the tabernacle? Verse number 12. Why? He said, that they may possess. Somebody say it with me. Come on, say it loud. That they may possess 
the remnants of Edom and all of the hidden which are called by my name, said the Lord that dread is. Okay? When David died, the function of the tabernacle died with him. Solomon had no capacity to carry on as David carried on. Are you listening to me? Okay? He didn't have that capacity. So gradually, all the structures of praise and prayer, David set up, kept on collapsing. It was worse under King Rehobram. Everything died in the house of God. So, at the battle fronts, there was stalemate. Israel was no longer conquering because power from the altar was no longer supplied to the battle front for conquest. So, there was stalemate, there was defeat, there was retreat from the battle front. Why? Because no more ministrations from the altar. As the altars no longer ministered to Jehovah, Jehovah also no longer supplied power for conquest. Are you with me, somebody? So much so that God lamented in heaven and screamed out in the book of Amos. He said, I miss the tabernacle of David and I will raise it up again through one person or the other. I will raise it up again so that Israel may possess again. In other words, no tabernacle, no possession. Oh my God. Is somebody following me? No altar, no possession. No altar, you can possess your legitimate possession. All right? It can be whatever. Positions. Post, ranks, entitlements, promotion. Peoples of the earth. Psalm 2 verse 8 said, Ask of me, and as I give you the hidden for your inheritance and the utmost part of the earth for your possession. So the men of the earth were unsaved, our uh, our possession. We are supposed to possess them as an inheritance for the Lord. But you see, no tabernacle, no inheritance possession. That's why many of you have not been able to enter into your inheritance. You are denied of several things and you just took it like that. You just took it like that. Denied of promotion, you fall there, they offer one. You are denied of good transfer, you fall one. You are denied of this. And so you live as a shadow of yourself. Why? Because the tabernacle is not functioning. I prophesy unto your life tonight. There shall be a restoration of the tabernacle of David in your life. Is somebody following me? That they may possess. Somebody said that they may possess. Somebody said that I may possess. So God said, I will raise it up again. So that Israel can go to the battlefront and conquer and possess. The remnant of the Edom that David could not conquer. The Edomites, the Amorites, that David did not conquer for old age. So remnants are spread over, waiting to be conquered and assimilated into greater Israel. But you see, the power to conquer lies in the tabernacle. Are you with me? So God said, I will restore that tabernacle and it's transgenerational. Wherever God restores the tabernacle of David, when he see vibrant, consistent praise and prayer, he will give power to possess. He will give. And I speak unto your life. As you enter into February, all your possessions by the grace of God shall be possessed again. <coughs> Lift up your right hand. Say in the name of Jesus. Say in the name of Jesus. Oh God. Restore in my life. The tabernacle of David. Oh God of Israel. Restore in my life. Restore in our church. The tabernacle of David. That we may possess. Have you understood what I'm saying? Perpetual praise. Perpetual prayer. Regular. I told you in the days of David, physical altar as prescribed by Moses functioned. Two of them. Altar of incense, altar of burnt offering, and then vocally, articulately from the altar of their spirits. They offer praise, offer worship, offer prayers. So at any given time, praise and prayer arrived in heaven in duplicates. God's response were overwhelming. God's responses to this were overwhelming. 
I challenge you to make sure from tonight the tabernacle of David is restored in your life. <coughs> Are you listening to me? You praise the Lord articulately. You pray passionately and fervently at regimented time, which we call the altar. Do it for one month and see the changes that will occur in your life. Possessions long denied will come to you. Possessions that the Amorites and the Ammonites are sitting upon, the Lord will unseat them and give you your possession in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Lift up your hand again. I'm going to pray one minute. Say, Father, by the Holy Ghost, restore in my life the tabernacle of David. By the Holy Ghost, restore in my life, in my church, in my family, the tabernacle of David. Come on, make sure you are praying that prayer. Oh God, restore unto me the tabernacle of David. In Jesus' name we pray. Stand on your feet and lift up your two hands. Loud and clear. You may not understand, you will understand later on. Say, Tabernacle of David. Awake in my life. Tabernacle of David. Awake in my life. Awake in our church. Prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Lift your hand again. Say, Davidic anointing. Can you make it louder? Davidic anointing for prayer. Davidic anointing for praise. In the name of Jesus, fall on me. Davidic anointing for praise, for worship, for intercession. Fall, 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 fall on me. Pray that prayer loud. In Jesus precious name we pray please take your seat quickly Exodus chapter 40 let's trace the history of the altar the first altar is to erased and what did he achieve Exodus chapter 40 you remember in Exodus 25 God instructed Moses to take generous offering in the wilderness also, offerings. He said that they may build for me, right, a tabernacle that I may dwell amongst them. So God wanted to dwell in the midst of Israel, but I asked them to pay for it. Say indirectly, my presence is not cheap. Pay for my presence. Be pained to secure my presence. So offer I me, mean, God could have imported the major tabernacle constructed by angels right into the midst of it, but he need to do that. He said, pay for it. Donate. So that Moses can raise a tabernacle and I may dwell in your midst. Okay? So in other words, pay for my presence. Pay for my body presence. Be paid for it. So they raised the tabernacle. And so, according to specifications, 
God had taken Moses to the mountain and showed him the blueprints of the heavenly tabernacle. And of course, God is the God of details and God of order. If you are out of order, his presence will not be there. It will offer strange fire. So he showed Moses. And three times they instructed Moses, be careful to build according to pattern. Shown to you on the mountain. Be careful. Anything out of order, I won't come. So Moses was meticulous in the construction of the tabernacle. Now the work had finished. And he began to put into place, all right, all the articles of worship, everything into their respective places. Now look with me, Exodus chapter 40. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 40. <clears throat> and verse 18. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set all the bows thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up the pillars. Verse 21. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle. The presence of God. He brought it there and set out the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony. Okay? And the Lord commanded Moses, 22, and he put the table in the tent of the congregation and the side, upon the side of the tabernacle, not what? Without, without the veil. That is the table of show bread. Okay? Verse 23, and he set out the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. 24. And he put the candlesticks, okay, in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. The refrain, as the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded. No human ideas. It has to be divine order, divine ideas throughout as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay? Verse 26. And he puts the golden altar. Somebody say golden altar. Come on, say golden altar. So that's titled golden altar of incense. Smallish. All right? Covered with gold, overlaid with pure gold. That was stayed in the holy place. We are incense burnt regularly to God. Golden altar. And then he burnt Swiss incense thereon. As the Lord commanded Moses, verse 28. And he set all the anger at the door of the tabernacle. Then the second altar. Okay? Which is at the outer court, the altar of burnt offering, by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offer upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. When he had finished, there was what we call the brazen lava. Big basin, where they washed their hands after touching a number of things. So, he had put three lights that lighted Israel. Eternal lights. One, the golden candlesticks, seven of them. And the Bible said the light upon the candlesticks must burn in perpetuity. Don't let the lights go out for any reason. All right? Then the second light upon the golden altar of incense, fire. All right? You need fire to burn incense. And the Bible said for the first time in Israel, incense was burnt. Aroma the Aroff went to the God of heaven for the first time. And secondly, the altar of burnt offering. The offer. The animals on those altars. Are you with me, somebody? Eh? Moses operated here as the priest. Now, Moses, I must say, all right, was three, a three in one man. He was the civil leader of Israel, political head of state of Israel. Then he was the prophet of Israel. Then he was the priest of Israel. And he functioned in the three since they left Egypt. Okay? So, in the wilderness, God said, after this assignment, concede one of your graces, one of your offices to your brother Aaron, okay? Relinquish the priesthood office unto him. You see that later on. That's not a matter. So, Moses operating as a priest of the altar now had offered <coughs> incense, offered bonds offering unto God, praise and prayer. For the first time in the history of history, and the moment the two altars roared to life supplying the God of heaven with the aroma he wanted the response of God verse number 34 everybody look at it verse 34 the response of heaven somebody say damn come on say damn a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord did what 
fill the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of the congregation because the cloud above their own and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken off from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onwards in all their journeys. And if the cloud was not taken off, then the journey not, the date was taken off. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and the fire was on it by night in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Praise the Lord. The response of God. And you will see, alright, in Nexus between the two altars and the coming of the glory. As the two altars came alive for the first time. The response of Jehovah was to supply the glory. Somebody say the glory. Come and say the glory. So we normally say the altar activates the glory of God. The altar activates God's glory. No altar, no glory. No altar, no glory. And you need glory to drive your life, power your life, power the church. There's one sermon I preach, the glory powered church. If your church is not glory powered, it's too bad. It's too bad. For 40 years, the church in the wilderness, the house of Israel, okay? Four million people were powered by glory throughout the wilderness. I'll tell you what the glory did for them in the wilderness. 40 years, Israel had what I call glory escort in the wilderness. Peculiar people, peculiar nation with glory escorts. The glory was on it, but they in form of a massive cloud. By night, before their very eyes, the cloud transformed to burning cauldron of fire. Who, who, shooting into heaven for 40 years. That's why they were invincible, unconquerable in the way that bizarre things in righteousness happened to them, courtesy of the glory. And God instructed them, Leviticus chapter 6, 12 and 13. He said, you saw how the glory came down. Okay? To sustain the glory in perpetuity. Because glory will handle your matters in the wilderness. Give you direction. Give you provision. But for the glory to be there in perpetuity, something that triggered the glory must be maintained. So he told them, Leviticus chapter 6, look at it, everybody. Chapter 6 and verse number 12. Leviticus 6, 12 and 13. <coughs> what says the scripture? Leviticus 6, 12 and 13. And it says, The fire upon the altar shall what? Be burning in it. It shall not be put out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay burnt offering in order upon it. And it shall burn the around the fat and the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. Is a what? Don't go out. Let it go out. Don't let it go out. If fire goes out, glory disappears. So the altar activates God's glory. Is somebody listening to me? So if you don't have an altar, thou shall be gloryless. And a gloryless Christian is a cheap Christian. The enemy will whack you. Oh my God, are you listening to me? It doesn't matter what you are doing for God. Now the early church was inaugurated in a place of glory. The same altar, but now spiritual altar. 120 men and women clustered together in the upper room for 10 days after Jesus left. Have you read it before? Acts chapter 1, 12 to 14. They went to an upper room. Men and women, 120, became the first human altar. And the Bible says, for 10 straight days, they were fasting and praying in the upper room. Pray, pray, anticipating the promise of the Father. And the Bible says, all at a sudden, making 50 days, and the exact 50 days after Jesus ascended to heaven. Okay? The Bible says, the glory came down, all right? Visible glory, tongues of fire, and rested upon every one of the 120. All right, visible glory, visible Holy Spirit, tongues of fire settled down on them. And the Bible says they were just animated. They become supernatural. They were doing the impossible because the glory had come. Are you listening to me? So, and that glory, the early church, 
You should read Acts chapter 1, 40, 41. They prayed. Acts chapter 3, there were hours of prayer in the temple. Okay, where James and John were going to the temple for hour of prayer. And they healed a man at the beautiful gate. Chapter 5, they prayed. Chapter 4, they prayed. And the place where they prayed was shaky. And uh, they were all filled fresh with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Prayer, prayer, prayer. By chapter 6, Prayer had died in the early church. The altar fire died in the early church. From chapter 6, you won't find prayer anymore. Glory departed in the early church. They were struggling over food matters, charity matters. Our widows are neglected in daily distribution. Blah, blah, blah. And everybody was employed in that. Large number, large problem. The bigger the head, the bigger the headache. And so, everybody, including the apostles, was struggling to maintain, all right, unity, sanity, and peace. But the population explosion, they couldn't handle. So, it affected their prayer potential, prayer quality, and quantity. So, prayer died. And the enemy rose up like a liar. By chapter 7, the enemy took upon Stephen and stoned him to death. Have you read it before? Chapter 8, chapter 9, he scattered the church. Everything they labor for scattered in Jerusalem. Okay? And he went on until chapter 12. Satan was on rampage. And he got so much that Satan took on the apostles themselves. The Bible say, Herod got up one morning and said, let me vex the church. Let me see how far I can go. He took on James, the brother of John. The Bible says, he cut off his head. And he was waiting for reaction from heaven. A choice apostle died a cheap death. He was waiting. Will heaven intervene? Will there be an earthquake? Will I be penalized? And he waited and waited no response because there was no glory in the church anymore. God couldn't handle the matter. Ah! A body by what he saw. He took on Peter and he was going to keep Peter. Twelve hours more before the execution of Peter. Then the church said, something is missing. Something is missing. What's missing? James have died. All right? Stephen had died. The church have been scattered. So it will be the turn of somebody else. What is me? Somebody say, back to where we started. The altar. The altar. The upper room. Boy, they went to the upper room. They prayed like crazy. Whilst they were praying, glory returned. God sent an angel to deliver Peter. Are you listening to me? Glory came back. I pray for you. Listen to me. Two apostles. Both of them were part. All right? Were inner circle members of Jesus. Closest associate of Jesus. James, John, Peter. One of them had the key. Jesus did nothing. He was watching in heaven. He didn't respond. So the enemy was embodied to take on Peter. And boy, if they didn't go back to the altar, if the fire did not get kindled again, they would have killed Peter neatly. And then they would have taken on John. Are you listening to me? What am I saying? James died a needless death. James died premature death. James did not fulfill his destiny, ministerial destiny, because the church was prayerless. And unfortunately also, as Peter was in the incarceration, okay, in jail, anticipating death, the Bible said the night before his execution, Peter was sleeping between four soldiers. And Peter alone, if you read the trajectory of his life, Peter was a prayerless man. One so long, month of transfiguration, egg badura, one so long. Are you listening to me? Gany of Gethsemane, one so long. So they didn't learn prayer. So in the day of trouble, he couldn't do what he was doing in the day of leisure. Are you listening to me? In the day of pressure, you will not be able to do what he did not do in the day of your leisure. Pressure was there. Agba Apostle was sleeping instead of praying. All right? You suppose that with chapter 16 of the book of us, they got Peter, I mean, they got Paul and Silas. Not them up. The same scenario. The Bible says at midnight, Paul roared to action. He was used to prayer. Silas was used to prayer. They prayed and prayed. In spite of their situation, heaven came down. Not Peter. But Peter slept in the face of death. He slept. He wasn't used to it. But for the father, the church went back to the altar, upper room, 
and run to action. They pray and pray, almost pray themselves out of faith. Then the glory returned, and in the midst of that glory, angel went forth and delivered Peter. If he didn't have a prayer cover, he would have gone the way of James. How many Christians have died needlessly? I pray for you today. You will go back to the altar. <laughs> Thou shalt go back to the altar. In the name of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to what I'm saying now? What are we saying? No altar, no glory. And when you are glorious, it's so evident there will be chain problems, difficulties that should never, never happen to a Christian. All right, you witness in your life, in the life of your children, things will go wrong. Once the fire of the altar dies, something correspondingly will die in your life. Marriage may die when the altar dies. Business may die when the fire on the altar dies. When the altar dies, your finances may die because your altar handles your external matters in life as a child of God. Once that, and that's what the enemy goes for. The enemy has no interest in your car. Your car is too small for Satan. Your house is too small for Satan. Are you listening to me? Not even your head. What the enemy is going for? The jugular, the prayer life, the altar. Once it can make two hours to gradually become one hour. One hour gradually become 30 minutes. He's getting you gradually. Oh Lord, gradually in here. After he succeeds in making your two hours to become 20 minutes of hurried prayer. Everything will start collapsing outside. And you think, since Africans are super, superstitious, what enemy is always responsible? What are is always responsible? Are you listening to me? Superstition. We will point accusing finger to somebody, not knowing that your altar fire has died. Once it dies, prepare to bury something. One department of your life, or there, something will correspond. We have resigned it. Once the fire on your altar dies, something in one area of your life will die as well. Have you examined your life to see what has died? And you are pointing fingers. Tonight, I want to command fire to return to your altar. In the name of Jesus. Are you with me, somebody? Lift up your hand before I close. And you are shouting seven times. Say, fire of God! Return to my altar! Oh my God, I'm not hearing somebody. Fire of God! Return! To my altar, fire of God, return to my altar, fire of God, return to my altar. Shout in the last time. <coughs> now open your mouth and pray. Oh God, oh God, oh God, Masse Lebo Sataya. In Jesus' name we pray. Pray this prayer. How many things kill James? How many things kill James? Three. One, personal prayerlessness. Two, corporate prayerlessness. Three, error. But error will not have a power. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 4, it says the glory shall be for a defense. When the glory of God surrounds you as it comes from the altar, you become insulated. You become inaccessible to the enemy. He said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most are abide under the shadow of the Lord. So, which means James was not under any shadow. Where you see a shadow, the real object is not too far. Where you see a shadow, the real object is not far away. So, you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, the owner of the shadow will be around there. Who dare touch you? But they taught James and they got away with it. They will have taught Peter and they will have got away with it. So I'm going to pray. What kill James will not kill me. Personal prayerlessness, personal altarlessness. What kill James? That is, James was killed because the church was prayerless. In chapter 6, the prayer life of the early church died. They were struggling over charity, food, and all that. So, their corporate altar, three times a day in the temple, nobody attended anymore. It's only food distribution because there were thousands. 
So the enemy penetrated there. Lift up that ones and say, as the Lord liveth. Oh my God, no hear you shall. Say, as the Lord liveth. As my soul liveth. What killed James shall not kill me. As the Lord liveth. As my soul liveth. What killed James shall not kill me. Prayerlessness shall not kill me. Corporate prayerlessness shall not kill me. No error shall kill me. Prayer. Mabo Shapa Likalo Setelimaya Marabo Se Leko Marin de Lebo Setaya Maran de Lebo Sataya Ibra non Sete Frenende Gilaya Jesus, nay, we pray. Please, all somebody to my job. Scripture says, if two of you shall agree together, as nothing, anything, it shall be done unto you by my Father in heaven. He said, two are better than one. Lift the two hands to the God of heaven. All right, if you know the name of that fellow, all right, call the name, otherwise, say, my brother, my sister. Say, my brother. Say, my brother. I prophesy over your life the mistake. That killed James shall not kill you. The error that killed James will not kill you. Error will not get you. In the name of Jesus, my brother, I command your altar. Come along, prayer. Mabo Shapa Mabo Setili Katoma and Dalikataya Irabo Sapaya Jesus, nay, we pray. Raise the two hands to the God of heaven and saw this. The two hands hold the hell together. Hold the two hands together. Still hold your brother or your sister in unity. Lift the two hands to the other. Say, my brother, my sister, in the name of Jesus, receive fresh fire upon your altar. My brother, my sister, in the name of Jesus, receive fresh fire on your altar. Prayer. Ah! 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 Marose Liga Liga.
In Jesus name we pray. I told you one of the functions of the altar is to activate God's glory. Isn't it? There are so many examples in the Bible. Now it's life treating you as if you are not a child of God. It's life treating you as if you are a Muslim. It's life treating you as if you are a club goer. No difference between they are, you are sick the way they are sick. You are afflicted the way they are afflicted. Your business collapses the way they are. So nothing shows you a covenanted child of God. Why? Because of the absence of glory. Chapter 4, the book of Samuel. When that woman delivered it, how many things happened simultaneously, which was very abnormal in the life of history. Okay? 30,000 Israeli soldiers were slaughtered by the Philistines. One day, that same day, Israel lost a needless battle. They don't lose battles in Israel. If everything was okay. That same period, are you listening to me? Two sons of the high priest, of me of me, yes, was slaughtered at the battlefront. That same day, the act, the symbol of his glory, with the father's preserved, with broad glory, the act was captured by the enemy. That same day, so the woman was in labor, prolonged labor, and when she came back to him, and all the midwives said, "Congratulations, congratulations!" His name shall be called Ayomiko. He said, "Ayomiko, Ayomiko." He said, "You saw this series of disaster." He points to something. The glory has departed. With glory intact, all this will not have happened. So, aptly called the boy, he capped. Glory has departed. Some of you today, your situation is he capped situation. You are going to ask the Lord in prayer. Oh, glory of the Lord, resume duty in my life. Listen, when glory resume duty, ha, you will know. People will know. Your neighbors will know. Now, lift up your hand and prophesy louder than before. Say, oh, glory of the Lord. Thou glory of the Lord. Resume duty in my life. Thou glory of the Lord. Resume duty again. Prayer. Ah, Rabos. <coughs> ah. He will go to Mark Padabo. He will go to Mark Padabo. I say, you mean? In Jesus' name we pray. Stretch your hands before I close. I'll just list it 10 minutes more and then we close at the very vantage point. Lift up your hands to the altar. I join you in faith that the glory which had departed will resume duty in your life again. I invite the glory, the Shekinah, to resume duty in your business again. Glory. Resume duty in the churches again. Glory of God. Handle our matters. Glory of God. Be our escort in year 2023. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In every department of our life we invite you glory of god resume duty again and don't let life treat us as ordinary anymore don't let situations treat us as if we are unbelievers in the name of jesus christ so shall it be in the name of god the father and the son and the holy ghost let me ask some women like thunder. Tell your neighbor, the glory is coming back. 
Yes, now you're about again the glory. It's coming back. Take your seat. Eight major things Israel harvested from the glory of God. The glory is not there for being their sake. The glory delivers certain goods. Eight major things Israel collectively harvested from the glory that tabernacle upon them. And I said, the altar sponsors the glory. Number one, the glory gave them direction. The wilderness being a directionless terrain, anywhere you face is sand and sand dunes. Hundreds of kilometers in every direction. So you could easily get lost in the wilderness. God knowing that gave a supervising glory. So each time the glory moved, the glory cloud or pillar of fire, they followed steadfastly. They followed steadfastly until they got to the promised land. The glory gives direction. Some people say, I don't know what God is saying. I'm so confused. I don't know what God is saying this year. People say, the Lord told me the Lord is because you have not been to the altar properly. When you go to the altar and the glory shows up, one of the functions of the glory is to give you direction, give you instruction, give you guidance. And it's your entitlement as a covenanted child of God to receive guidance and direction from He said, my sheep hears my voice. Are you listening to me? So, everybody can get direction from the glory. But before the glory comes and stays, the altar must be intact. So that's why I say, the fire upon the altar, Israel, I mean, your ears, the fire must ever burn on the altar perpetually. Don't let it go out or hear the fire go out. Billy, the glory disappears. You are your own in the wilderness. And the enemy will mess you up. So meticulously, Aaron and Co, Eliezer, they burned sacrifice twice a day. There was always smoke of the incense, smoke of the burnt offering in the tabernacle day and night. And soon, as long as there was fire under, there was glory over. Are you with me? Fire under, on the altar. Glory over. If that fire goes out, the glory disappears. So number one, it gave them direction. Number two, protection. They were protected by the cloud. Protected by the fire. Are you aware that the wilderness is a place of climatic contrast? In the afternoon period, is 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 boilingly hot. Temperatures, all right, nearly fifty degrees centigrade. You know what fifty degrees centigrade is? Fifty-five in the wilderness. Here, when temperature reaches 29 or 30 or 16, now we are feeling hot. It's so hot now. We are talking about 50, 55 in the desert. The sun will easily fry your blood in the wilderness. In the night, it becomes freezingly cold, amazingly cold, climatic contrast. God, being aware of that, He made sure that the supervising cloud became like a covering umbrella. Israel moved like a nation. Lagos is about 22 million people. Oshobo is about 4 million. Ilori, 4 million. You can imagine a city like Ilori moving in the wilderness. Everybody in Oshobo moving at once. A whole city in motion. So God, apart from the cloud being an embodiment of glory, the cloud served as a massive umbrella over a city of four million people. So the sun could not smite them by the day, not the moon, but the night. Are you listening to me? Day in the night, that thing that is cloud changed to burning fire, burnt almost 20 kilometers into the heavens. We are told they can see that fire a hundred kilometers off, burning, woo, woo, woo. And what did this supply? In the cold, heat, everybody. So 40 years, nobody fell sick because of cold. Nobody had any sunstroke because the cloud handled the matter. I pray for you this year. As you go through your wilderness of this 23rd year of this century, the cloud will handle your matter. The sun will not smite you. In the name of Jesus, 
And then provision. They had more than enough. Everywhere the cloud. Hallelujah. Everywhere the cloud stayed, provision was made available. Are you with me, somebody? There was food. If there was no food at all, manna was supplied. Okay, are you with me? If the cloud stayed in a location where there was no water, all right, the rock, we had to provide water. Everywhere the cloud took them, provision was available. This year, you will not suffer lack. The glory we handle your provision matters. You shall be fed. You shall be watered. The Lord shall provide for you. Because glory is a resuming duty. Number four, the cloud gave them assurance. Somebody say assurance. Come on, say assurance. You have in the wilderness desert pirate, robbers. Now these folks were carrying articles of gold and silver. They were weighed down with the riches of wealth of Egypt. And the enemy was aware of that. Trailing them, poised to strike. But they couldn't strike. Security. They knew they were carrying precious material. Desert pirates and robbers wanted. And to the teeth, but they couldn't strike. Why? Courtesy of the cloud. You'll be a madman to attack a people under fire. Are you with me? Oh my God, somebody is not hearing me. You'll be a lunatic. And before your very eyes, the fire transformed to a cloud in the day. In the night, the cloud transformed to fire. So they trailed them, armed, poised to strike, but they couldn't strike. For fear petrified them. They saw the cloud. Today I prophesy, your life will no longer be cheap. Thou shall no longer be cheap to the enemy. The cloud will scare the enemy away. The cloud will petrify your adversaries. In the name of Jesus Christ. So he gave them both assurance, security, and confidence. Each time somebody woke up and said, hey, we're in trouble in the wilderness. The enemies are following us. Somebody tells and says, you get out of your tent. He gets out. Hey, I'm afraid though. I'm afraid though. The Amalekites are there. The killers, spearing nobody. Oh, the ruthless killers. Somebody say, follow me. And he goes out. He said, look up. What do you see? He said, cloud. He said, with this cloud, you and I, our families are protected. In the night, somebody wakes up, goes to the toilet, say, hey, we are surrounded by this. Say, Hold your peace. What do you see? Fire. With that fire, go back to sleep. Nothing will hurt you. So they had assurance. Because the cloud was always there and they saw it. And say from this year, your confidence will return. Your assurance will return. Thou shalt no longer be afraid of the night. Nor the arrows that fly by the day in the precious name of Jesus. Number five, the cloud gave them identity. Somebody's identity. They were uniquely treated by God. No nation was treated like that. Okay? They were men of the cloud. They were men of glory. Glory powered, glory supervised, and glory driven. It gave them peculiar identity. My, your identity is not that sticker, first quarter sticker. I'm a member of Redeemer. I'm a member of yes, That's not your identity in the realm of the spirit. Your identity to the witches, to the wizard, to the killer is glory. Are you listening to me? Sticker, wristband is not your identity. Just white. Your identity is glory. And you will carry this glory this year. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. So I give them corporate identity. What did I say? Corporate identity. They were glory carriers. And number five or number six. The glory gave them strength and health. Psalms 105 verse 37. Psalms 105 verse 37. I'm coming close to the end. Psalms 105 verse 37. Are we together? I say, I've lost you also. Psalms 107, verse what? Oh, Psalms 105, beg your pardon, verse 37. 105, 37. And what says the scripture? It says here, He brought them forth also with what? Silver and gold. And there was no one feeble person among the tribes. They were strengthened 
energized that no one felt sick. 40 years trek in the wilderness and they were no sick. If somebody listen to me, God see of the glory. This year, you will not be as sick as you were last year. The glory will strengthen your motor bodies in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Alright? So, he gave them strength and health. Then, in number eight, the glory gave them supernatural laundry. What did I call it? Oh my God. Supernatural laundry. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 4 and Deuteronomy 29 5. Deuteronomy 20 chapter 8 verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 4. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse number 4. Your raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did the food swell these 40 years. Look at verse 20, chapter 29, verse 5 of the same Deuteronomy. 29, verse 5. Ah, something new will happen to your life this year. Chapter 29, verse number 5. And what says the scripture? I have led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxing old upon you, and your shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. You don't just okay, it's my time. Thank you, sir. All right. Now let me explain that. Israel was in the wilderness, isn't it? How many years? Come on, how many years? Now in the wilderness, there were no rivers. So there was no stopping to wash their clothes. So the clothes somebody left Egypt with was the clothes he wore to enter Canaan 40 years after. And the Bible said that clothes did not wax old, nor was it dirty. And they were sweating with the nest in the sun, you could sweat. But whatever happened to their clothes, it was newly laundered every morning, smelling fine. As they slept, before they woke up, the clothes had become new. Now, a five-year-old cloth you wore every day stand the chance of becoming ragged and torn. But this clothes they wore 40 years ago was still as new as they put it on in Egypt 40 years. Because they were under a supernatural all right, network. Number two, if you are 10 years old when you left Egypt and your shoe size was size maybe seven and a half or six and a half you wore that fitted you and you follow your parents with the little pink pink cloth you wore as you walk in the wilderness as you became 15 years the cloth enlarged to fit a 15 year old boy your cloth your shoe your shoe has enlarged to fit size eight because you are now a 15 year old now you go in the wilderness you are now a young man of 25, lanky, able to go to war, mighty, six-footer. Your clothes are equally enlarged to fit. All right? Now this 10 years old, now you are 25. 15 years after, your clothes are becoming. Now you enter Canaan at age 40. The man that left Egypt at age 10, entering Canaan at 40, you are now a 50-year-old man, big man. Your clothes as equally allowed to fit a 50 year old man your shoe is now size nine and a half because it grew as you grew your clothes enlarge as you enlarge if you understand this miracle you will appreciate what glory did for Israel. are you listening to me so moses said your shoe did not was old because you want changing shoes in the wilderness the one you wore as you left it is the one you wore to enter kena it enlarged as your body grew, so your clothes, your clothes enlarged. I want to pray for some. You will have something from the glory of God this year. Your life shall not be an empty life. Life will treat you with regard and respect. You will not be treated like an Egyptian. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? But as all this supernatural miracle was going on, some people are doing their duty inside the tabernacle. Who are they? The Levites and the priests. They were the altar, day and night. 
Sacrifice, incense. Going on, your shoe is growing. Somebody is paying the price. Non-stop offering. Non-stop incense. To generate the aroma that goes to God. As Lord smell the sweet summer. All right, it maintains the glory on top of day. I pray as to return back to the altar. And what is true of personal altar is true for corporate altar. Are you listening to me? The most deserted activity in the church of God today is prayer meeting. Isn't it? It's that people are scared of prayer. But that's where the glory and power is. That's where the glory and power is. And the devil will be stupid to allow you to do the thing that will ruin him. So that's why Satan is always overworked. He not many people to go for prayer meeting for night vigil. He's overworked. He's smart. I congratulate the devil. Big congratulations. He knows what he's doing. For you to do what will ruin him, he will not allow. I said to myself, Satan, you will not do what work in my life. I will pray when I like to pray. I will pray whether I don't like to pray. I will pray until I feel like praying. You cannot stop me from prayer because I know what I harvest from prayer. If you get nothing from prayer, oh my swear, it will become a routine. You'll be enduring prayer instead of enjoying prayer. I pray for those who are enduring prayer. You will begin to enjoy prayer this year. Because the presence of God shall be real to you. You will stay there at the altar until your situations are altered. Stand in your feet. Have you received something tonight? Three prayers and we are done. You're going to wait. Every overtime of Lucifer on my life in respect to prayer. Are you listening to me? Tonight, I command you to expire. Amen. Lift up to two hands, loud and clear. Say every satanic overtime. Oh God. I pardon you because you are fasting. A bit in one. Okay. All of my boy is supernaturally. Lift up to hands. Say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I prophesy. No satanic overtime. Shall succeed. Over my prayer law. In the name of Jesus. I prophesy. Over my life. Over my church. Over my altar. No satanic overtime. Shall succeed. Prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tomorrow, as the Lord say, I receive a strong appetite for your presence. Are you with me? David said in your presence, that's what fullness of joy at your right hand. It depends on appetite. David will tell you in Psalm 42, he said, my soul thirsty, my heart hungers, for your presence. Psalm 84, 1 and 2. He said, I hunger for your presence. Psalm 63. David had this insatiable hunger. Appetite. You can't drink more than your thirst. You can't eat more than your hunger. Oh, he carries such. When David, as a monarch, with monarchical responsibility, all right, army responsibility as a field marshal, as father of many Children, a husband of many wives, so much responsibility. But when David enters into the presence of God, he gets lost. David will tell you in Psalm 55, 17, he said, Three times a day, I pray at the altar. King, go, because some people hide under the, 
under the under the foolish excuse. I'm busy. I'm a managing director. I'm a, I'm a, I'm this. I'm a politician. I'm a permanent secretary. I'm a principal. I'm a professor. I don't have time. When the enemy slaps you twice on your hospital bed, you will have time. When he hits you with nightmare and you wake up with pain, you will have time. People give excuses. Daniel supervised 122 provincial governors. And yet, three times a day, he was before the Lord. He had time. And when Daniel is praying, he forgets that it's time. That's why he was preserved. Daniel entered Babylon at age 17 and died at age 82. He lived through a lot of conspiracies and intrigues. He lived to old age, even when thrown to the lion's den. Prayer saved his life. The altar handled the matter. So are you. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. Until the day the enemy hits you hard. Before you know that priority at the altar will keep you away from danger. Is somebody hearing me? Is somebody hearing me? I told you that we fought 66 battles international. He won all decisively. If somebody survived two assassination attempts, likely who the third, the fourth, they will get him. But 21 attempts on his life. Many of them from his principal, King Saul, he escaped all. The glory handled the matter. I pray for you. As you go into this year, the glory will handle your matter. The glory will handle your matter. You shall not die a cheap death in the precious name of Jesus. Lift up your two hands. Again, we are praying before we pray it again. Say, My altar, my altar, come alive again. Prayer, yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Ma sheke bo riga liga taya. In Jesus' name we pray. Join your hands collectively. I'm done. Join your hands collectively. Everybody, wherever you are. Every other four square altar anywhere in the world is under the power of this altar. Alright? No four square altar. Four square Nigeria operates independently. They operate dependently. Their grace, their power comes from this altar. So we stand at that altar by the alignment of altars. We will send power to every altar at the fringes. Are you with me? Four square altars, wherever you are, all over the world, receive fresh fire. Are you listening to me? Raise those hands to the God of heaven and raise a lanka. Say four square altar. All over the world. Four square priests. Say priesthood of first square. Wherever you are, altars of first square all over the world. Receive fresh fire, fresh fire, fresh fire, fresh fire, prayer. Ah. Fire upon your altar. Specialized prayer. Let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. In Jesus' name we pray. We stand at this central altar. And I command fire from off the altar. Go to every four square altar under this heaven and kindle a new fire. Kindle a new fire. Four square priests and pastors, wherever you are, receive fresh fire. 
fresh appetite for the altar. In the name of Jesus. Dead others come alive. Dead others awake. In the name of Jesus. Expired glory become new again. Departed glory resume duty again. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, this year, your life shall be glory supervised. You will go through the wilderness of this year with glory escorts. Glory gives you direction, protection, provision, healings, victory in battle. In the name of Jesus Christ. Go forth and become different in society, in your place of work, in the marketplace. Stand out because of the glory you carry. So shall it be. In the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Let me again hear seven amens like thunder. There are so many prayer books. Listen to me, like the resident pastor said. Once you get in touch with a book or CD or DVD or whatever, they carry prayer. I will tell you testimonies of what happened 94 here. Particularly a woman, the first woman DIG, Deputy Inspector General of Police, Mama Cecilia Ogoe, who I forced to attend this meeting. Mama is 84, 87 now. The fire she received there, Mama could hardly play 10 minutes. She met me at Redeem Mikoyi, and I was shouting that somebody can pray to her. And I said, When I pray to her, I'm just warming up. Six hours, five hours. She opened her mouth and got, Reverend, you mean somebody can pray one hour? I will not repeat repeating himself. I said, One hour is cheap. It's just one more. He said, What? He said, Me, I'm coming from Sele to join, join, to join Redeem. I can't pray more than 10 minutes, no matter what I do. So lay hands on me that this grace may I say is not cheap. We are running a prayer school now at first school. Mama, she was 50 something years, active service, DIG, first woman DIG in Nigeria. I said, come. And she came through the five weeks that remain. And in this auditorium, lay hands of everybody. She got home that night to the glory of God. God is here. She prayed six hours non-stop. She thought it was a joke. Said, come on. She wanted to just wake up at five, pray. To 20 minutes, I know that because all the official vehicles, the starlight, riders, motors, you know, outriders were waiting to take her to police headquarters. She woke up at five. She didn't come out on the 12th afternoon. He said, I couldn't just stop praying. He said, You put it there after two months, she called me and said, Reverend, you have messed up my schedule. I can't attend office now. Please ask God to reduce the anointing. It's, yes. She said to me, Say, I can't undo it. So I told her, It's like that for everybody. This is how to manage the anointing. You will enjoy it. It will disturb your schedule because you feel like praying everywhere in the toilet on your desk. So she had the wisdom. Now she has retired. In fact, six months after she started the police senior officers fellowship, prayer fellowship in a house at VI. She has retired now. Mama is 84, 85. She's still running a police prayer fellowship. She got it from here. The fire of prayer is real. The anointing is real. That was worse, but direct contact. But some, through the Facebook, they say, we saw you on TV. Hey, we read your book. Carry any book there. This one came out this very day. I had to refurbish it. The altar, the sacrifice, and the blessing. Okay? How altars can influence and affect your life and the life of communities and death and nations. This one is loaded. It's the first ever you will see around. This one, this is the 15th edition. The one we printed 94, did not last three weeks here. Every four square pastor had one. Specialized prayers. Okay. I'll tell you more about the books tomorrow, but grab anyone with prayer points, kneel down, pray them, irrespective of the problems the prayer points are solving. They will just put fire in you. We carry that. That's why I've been in ministry of prayer for the past 46 years. Non-stop. Tomorrow we are doing VG. Okay. Bring seven things you expect God to do before the end of this year. Are you with me? Write on a sheet of paper and put in a white envelope. 
my covenant prayer request because you are covenanted to two covenants everyone that is born again abrahamic covenant is on you and mizani covenant you carry you're a covenanted child you're a covenantee so based on the covenant you must be able to harvest something from the covenant you carry so we're explaining that tomorrow how to recover your inheritance from strangers so tomorrow we titled breaking the rod of the wicked over your inheritance breaking the rod of the wicked over your inheritance say the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon your inheritance so every rod that is resting upon your inheritance we shall break it and before even this month expires some of you you will enter into your inheritance finally so tell them us no seat abroad tomorrow we're going to pray over prayer requests ditto for sunday morning god bless you praise the lord you see when just rise up just rise up just rise up just rise up jam your hand unto the lord just jam your hand and appreciate god for what god has done Amen. I want you to just stretch forth your hand unto the man of God. Just stretch forth your hand. Stretch forth your hand. Virtues have gone out of him. I want us to pray that the hand of the Lord that have been, mind, that have been mighty upon this servant of God over years will continue, to, will continue to increase in the geometrical progression. That the hand of the Lord will continue to rest upon him. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your servant. We thank you for bringing him our way. Amen. Father, we worship your name. We glorify you. For in Jesus' precious name, we pray. We call on daddy to please pray for the servant of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We give you praise because you are ever faithful. Lord, we just exalt you for what you have done here tonight. Accept our thanks and praises in Jesus' name. Thank you for your servants. Thank you 